Okay, uh, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jinghua Zhao, Professor of Cities and Transportation at MIT. Uh, welcome to the MIT Mobility Forum designed by the MIT Mobility Initiative. Uh, as I wrote in the email to everyone for this fall, uh, in addition to the classic academic presentation, we also introduced three sub-series. The first one are women leaders in transportation. The second one are wills and deals, investment in mobility. And the third one is the synergy between venture capital and the startup in mobility, right? So all three of the sub-series, uh, we are curating the content at the moment. And if you have any suggestion, welcome uh, to, to send to me and we can design accordingly on this. Uh, then today, I, I'm really glad to have Professor Sandy Pendant joining us. Uh, actually, again, uh, three years ago, uh, Professor Pendant helped actually open the MIT Mobility Forum as the first speaker on the topic of social consequences of a mobility system. And today, I have the pleasure to have Sandy back again to discuss how to engineer an ecosystems with AI. This is actually a sneak peek uh, of the keynote speech that uh, Sandy will give at the US National Academy of Engineering here. Right. So our society needs to design and implement a, a whole set of system of people and the technology. But it seems that we have a difficulty doing it well. Uh, for instance, our system for dealing with the pandemic, dealing with climate change, uh, with congestion in transportation, with inequality, with financial stress, has been less than successful. And much of the difficulties, as Professor Pendant argued, are because of the unanticipated human behaviors. And perhaps as a consequence, the Congress new infrastructure bill expands the definition of infrastructure to include human and social infrastructure. So I'm so glad that today, Professor Pendant here will talk about how the new approach to engineer ecosystem that better integrate human behavior. And also second, discuss how the new technologies like a large language model, LLM, such as ChatGPT, can help. Professor Penderland directs the MIT Connection Science, is an MIT wide initiative, and also previously helped create and direct the MIT Media Lab. He's one of the most cited computational scientists in the world. So before I pass the forum to Sandy, I'd like to announce a few norms of the forum and also get people warm up. First one is in the chat, I invite everybody to type your organization, your city, and your local time. So I get a sense of the audience here, right? So I will type MIT, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and now it's the 12.05, yeah. Dr. Vishwanath from India, Mumbai, Yeah, we invite everyone to type in the chat so that we'll get a sense of that. Cool. Yeah, as we can see, there's a diversity of the audience. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, secondly, uh, given the topic today uh, relates to uh, the uh, large language model, so let me do a like a very brief poll to get a sense of the background of the audience related to the LLM. So I, I project the poll now. Uh, so the first choice is. Uh, you're doing research on LLM, right? Uh, making methodological contribution to it. The second one is uh, you're applying the large language model in your own practice. And the third one is uh, you're a carrier user, you try chat GPP, right? are aware of it. And then last one, no little of it. Right. I'll give five more seconds. Okay, I will close the poll and share the result. Uh, Sandy, you can see the result here. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Three percent doing research, sixteen applying, twenty-seven carry user, then about thirty aware, and the twenty-five no later. Yeah. Thanks. 
So finally, okay. I was to state the norm of this forum, right? I really want to reinforce that. You know, in most online sessions, the default of the audience is silence. Uh, in this forum, we will try to challenge this default, right? So this is actually a request to everybody in the in the forum, giving you you choose to spend one hour here. We invite everybody, everybody to contribute one idea. This idea can be in the form of a comment or a question. And please type them directly into the chat. In the second, the third part, the one will curate the questions from the audience and pass them to Professor Pendeland for his uh, uh, response to that. Right. Without further ado, uh, let's welcome Professor Sandy Pendeland. Please, Sandy. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, a little intimidating to be here with over 200. Uh, presumably specialist in faculty, but uh, as uh, was mentioned, this is sort of a warm up for an even more frightening audience when I'm on a keynote at the US National Academy. So um, as you heard the motivation here uh, is that we haven't been doing very well with our uh, systems that include people. So for instance, uh, vaccination systems, uh, some of the financial systems, we've had crashes and things. Uh, and so what's going on there? And a couple of years ago, I gave a talk about models of humans uh, that could be applied in these areas to be able to account for cascades, panics, and other sort of highly nonlinear long-tailed phenomena. Uh, and as uh, Genoa mentioned, the new uh, federal infrastructure bill uh, Includes social structure as its definition. And it's because of the failures, as you can sort of see. So this is sort of a, a little bit of a hint about if you want to get money out of the new federal <laughs> infrastructure bill, um, maybe you should you know, put a little of this in there and, and that will be a differentiating uh, element for you. Um, so let me give you just sort of a simple recap and then we'll get off to the sort of LLM AI sort of thing. So imagine that you had a, a simple sort of extended census. So you had traffic monitors, you had other sorts of uh, things, credit cards. We've used phones, uh, traffic sensors, purchasing patterns. You can use all sorts of things where you aggregate the data like census data. So it's not particularly risky. And you begin to ask things that are not normally known, which is where does a community work, shop, and play? If they go to one place to shop, uh, do they go, where else do they go the second time? Because people's behavior is extremely patterned and having this sort of aggregate mobility data, which is real time, uh, can be real time, uh, poses minimal privacy risks and people widely understand that it's not uh, something that's a very threatening thing. But look at the sort of thing that you can do. So this is just a simple example, recent publication. Um, we looked at vaccination rates across the whole U.S. And you could say, well, OK, we know that people move from one place to the other. And of course, when they move, they infect each other. So there's a, a, a transfer that happens. And we can ask, well, so if you're in uh, one infected area and you go to an unvaccinated area, you're likely to do some damage. Uh, how does that affect your uh, vaccination strategy? And you can see the little graph off at the right that you could do uniform uh, uh, vaccination campaign, uh, which will, uh, so one in percent increase in the vaccination rate actually does a pretty good job of well, a little over 2% at reducing uh, infection rate. Random sampling uh, where uh, you just try to scatter it around uh, does the same. Uh, politically, it's often uh, uh, there's a push to do the least vaccinated or the minority uh, communities. And that, in fact, is a little better. But if you take the people uh, that are most central in the mobility network, and remember, this is not just going to work and it's not just uh, um, cars or public transportation, it's all the mobility. And you focus on them, you can get an 8% increase, uh, decrease in infection rate from that 1% in investment in increased vaccination rate. And actually, if you apply this sort of optimization techniques that are common 
in transportation, you can reach almost 10% uh, reduction. That is hugely better than what we actually did. And what it's doing is bringing in very simple information about patterns of mobility uh, within people. It changes what you do pretty dramatically. So the place that my group has been focused on and what I talked about a few years ago is this notion of so social exploration. So uh, people explore in different communities than the ones that they lived in, and that results in diffusion of ideas. Right? So this is a lot of studies about this across the whole country in most uh, continents, uh, all continents on earth, most countries. And it's been shown that this social exploration, this uh, intersect interaction between groups with different cultures, different opportunities, different skills is a strong causal factor. And I mean, typically we see numbers in the 30 to 50% of the variance range in the spread of commerce between communities. Uh, historical uh, study just came out showing that immigration from different communities accounted for a huge fraction of the innovation rates in the United States during the 1800s and uh, for growth in commercial capabilities between countries. That's the big study we did in China. And as a consequence, um, this notion of sort of uh, exposure between people, very much like the disease exposure, but this is exposure to transmit ideas and opportunities and skills, predicts GDP growth in cities and neighborhoods around the world. And we've done studies on four continents and found again, quite regularly, between 30 and 50% of the variance in GDP growth is accounted for by this factor, even after you control for centrality of the neighborhood, education, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's huge, uh, but it's typically neglected. So if you look at average person, uh, uh, this is a, a where they visit diagram. The big things are uh, where they, the big circles are where they visit more often. The big arrows are, the frequency with which they uh, go from one place to the other. And you can see that there's a core, uh, and then there's this periphery of places that people visit very rarely. Um, different people, even of exactly the same income, exactly the same cultural background, have different types of exploration. Some people are very worried, shy, uh, uh, and they don't explore much. Some people are ebullient and fearless, and they explore a lot. And what ends up happening is the ones that explore a lot, even controlling for other factors you might mention, uh, make more money over a period of time. There's also uh, their kids grow up uh, to, to be more socially mobile, many, many good things. And as I mentioned, uh, we've done studies in four continents, and this is pretty much universally true. So you might want to say, OK, well, can we design transportation systems to promote mixing between uh, different communities, communities with different skills, different opportunities? Um, and the first thing to notice is, is that we've shot ourselves in the foot in the last couple of years with the pandemic. So uh, on the left hand side at the top where it says April 2019, the color there, the blues are places where there's mixing between different communities in the city of Boston. And then during lockdown, that's April 2020, obviously much less mixing, but it hasn't come back. That's October 21. It's still not back. So we still have much less uh, integration between our communities. And of course, that's hurting all sorts of things, particularly minority communities. And so Nick Caro is working for Jinhua uh, uh, as his advisor, um, asked the question, how can we design transportation systems that better promote this sort of mixing? And this is an example of using public libraries as co-working spots. And which public libraries would you establish the co-working spots in if you wanted to promote the most uh, mixing? So he found that uh, these four locations, five locations are the best out of the current uh, public library things. And if you want, you should look at Nick's thesis. It's wonderful. Um, so um, the question then arises, can we do a lot better than just having people rub rubbing shoulders? And an observation is, is that we really need to more so than we think. 
So this is a, a recent PhD thesis of mine, Isabella Loaza, uh, looking at the US government's ONET job transition and skills data. And what she found is something that people really hadn't noticed much before, which is, is that the, the medium skill, the low skill and the high school skill communities don't intermix. In other words, if you get a job in your mid twenties, that's a mid skill job. So, you know, you're uh, helping run a restaurant or something, you will never transition to a job that's a high skill. If you're in a high skill job, when you uh, get out of uh, school, um, you will stay in that income category and that skill category and never have medium skill things. And if you're low skill, you're just out of luck. You don't get into either of them except quite rarely. So this is a complete failure of what you might call continuing education. Uh, it obviously has, uh, the, the, our current educational system is not uh, doing the best it could, but once they get out of school, they're frozen. And that's really uh, terrible. So what can we do about that? And the hopeful signs are that things like large language models, uh, things like chat GPT, help medium skill workers more than high skill. So that's really interesting. In many different tasks, we see that like programming, writing, things like that. If you give the same tool to medium skill workers, they become more productive, they get a greater increment of productivity than if you give it to high skill workers. And that suggests that maybe what we want to do is we want to be able to use this capability to be able to uh, break that notion of uh, that observed uh, segregation, that lock-in and, and uh, of lack of skills. Um, and the first question is to ask, why is this possibly true? And uh, the various sorts of uh, uh, literature on this, uh, which has been one of our major uh, uh, endeavors is to contribute to that literature. And you see some of the, uh, the citations there is how do you describe human behavior? Uh, how do you describe how humans make decisions? And the typical thing, of course, is that you select an action, a posterior probability of, a, a, of an action being good based on your estimate of the likelihood. But in fact, that's not what people do. What people do is quite literally multiply that by the popularity, the action among their community. And they use that as a prior. This makes a Bayesian estimation, obviously. Um, and the fact that most models don't include that popularity of action in the immediate network uh, is why they miss things like uh, panics and cascades and uh, other sorts of, uh, of trending things. And one of the reasons that these AI tools might help medium scale uh, thing, people more than high skilled is it can suggest actions that you hadn't thought of. So if you're not integrated into the work community or into the, the, the commercial community, you don't quote unquote know the ropes. If you're high skilled, you probably do. The fact that you don't know the ropes means you won't think of the right things to do and you can't, of course, therefore uh, evaluate them as a good or not good uh, line of action. So how can you get uh, AIs to do this? Well, uh, you can build AIs that augment this social exploration. And remember, this is a major causal factor in income growth, both for individuals and for communities. Uh, and what they actually do is they estimate this from online conversations. So I have an endowed chair at MIT. I got it uh, when Marvin Minsky, who named the field AI, uh, retired. And what he always used to tell me is that the most important thing in AI is, that people weren't doing is common sense. How do you get a sense of what everybody else thinks? Uh, and that's what these LLMs do. It's really interesting. They are a statistical assessment of what everybody is saying. Uh, when you use them, of course, you have to ask coming out to what community. So uh, current LLMs are weird because they're trained on things like Reddit and Reddit is full of craziness. If you train your LLM on say physics journals, you'll get something that's really pretty good about physics. Won't be 100% right, but it will be the sort of common wisdom about physics. And just to give you the 90 second tutorial because people are not familiar with it, but there's an enormous amount of press. 
You can imagine uh, that there's a space of words that people say in any one particular language. And I'm going to steal slides from Stephen Wolfram here, who uh, uh, has done some of the best uh, work on, on reasoning systems. Um, and you can imagine that sentences are transitions between these words. So you see these conversations moving around in circles among the words. And of course, millions and billions of people are having these conversations. So there's all these trails that are created over time among the word tokens. And what the LLMs do is they use a, a neural net architecture to compress that and pull out the major uh, paths or features of conversation among uh, all of the people. And these are huge. So they can have a huge amount of uh, uh, conversations that they uh, account for. Um, and incidentally, you hear all this stuff about large models. Recently, uh, a type of model that came out of uh, MIT uh, is called liquid neural networks. And it is four or five orders of magnitude more efficient in terms of nodes and uh, neurons uh, than most of the ones that you hear about. So size is not necessarily connected to uh, performance here. So what, what these LLMs do is it gives you a probability distribution of the next word. So if I gave it a prompt, which is the best thing about AI is its ability to, then it makes an estimation of the most likely next word, which in this case is learn. But it could be with a little less likelihood, predict or make or understand. And most of these LLMs add noise. So you don't always get learned. Sometimes you get predict, occasionally you get make, and so on and so forth. And in fact, all of the possible completions of that uh, prompt, that beginning sentence, make have a long tail distribution. So that depending on the noise, you can get words like run, combine, catch, and talk. Uh, and what it does then, of course, is it just recycles. It says the best thing about AI is the ability to, and then it adds create, create worlds, creates worlds that, and it keeps going until it hits an end token, and then you have a sentence. And that's all it's doing, is it's giving you samples. It's like a Monte Carlo sample of a probability structure, which is built from all the word transitions that it observes in its huge amount of training. And if you repeat that training with noise, then you can get a probability distribution of what people think about A given B. And of course, that's exactly what you need to make decisions. So, so that's the 90 second version of it. Let me show you some consequences. So uh, this is something we did some years ago, personal investing. Uh, it turns out that uh, people copy each other, they learn from each other, but they have limited capacity. And if you use a computer tool to augment their social exploration and say, hey, look at this too. Other people like you do this. What you find is they make more money. And as you add more and more strategies to them as suggestions, they make more money until they hit a point where there's a cognitive limit and they just can't keep it all in their head. So that's really pretty interesting. You can actually make people invest better. Cool. Here's one paper uh, that came out of Wharton um, where they were asking uh, LLMs and people for novel ideas for low cost products. And the first uh, column in the middle uh, to the left here is humans. And the vertical action is uh, purchase, uh, purchase intent as, uh, as evaluated by a large number of third party people. And you see the people come up with you know, things that are pretty good. But GPT-4 does a little better on average. And GPT-4 was some, prompted by some good examples, um, does even better. So it's coming up with things that are on average a little more marketable, some that are quite a bit more marketable. And if you have the humans rated on a novelty, you find something that's a little bit different. You find that the humans are a little better about novelty, uh, but not hugely and certainly not significantly. Uh, and so people take this, of course, as the idea that, oh, LLMs are creative. It's artificial general intelligence. But no, that's not true at all. What you're doing is producing tools that 
uh, bring together all the conversations that people have, and that can be used to aid social exploration. There's nothing new in there, uh, except a little bit of statistical randomness would play with words. Uh, and uh, you needn't be afraid that it's going to uh, take over the world. On the other hand, you're gonna have to use stuff like this to make sure that you consider all the examples that you should do. And many of my friends in the sciences use these tools to say, well, are there other experiments I should consider or other tools? So let's go to that. So we all know about science citations and they make a sort of language. So it's a little different than the LLMs are trained on. You could train it on citations for us. What does the space of citations look like? And it has many of the statistical properties that you see in LLMs and in language. Uh, and this is an interesting uh, uh, little movie we created. So you see at the top, it says what year. So it's doing all the way from, uh, let's see, from the late 30s up to the present. And there's that blue star, which is a paper that was done back in the 30s. And uh, what you're seeing, each dot, is a paper in the physics literature. And what this looks like is an amoeba searching the space. So people are, are triggered by each other to write things that are nearby. They try to find the edges so that amoeba moves in various ways. And when the, when the amoeba of science gets in the region of that blue star, which is sitting there all lonely with no citations for 30, 40 years, right? suddenly it gets a huge number of citations. And what's interesting is you can actually do a pretty good job of predicting citation count before you write the paper. So this is an example of precision at predicting uh, citation count. Uh, the orange bit at the top is uh, uh, the predictions based on social characteristics of the paper, where the paper fits in this embedding space of the community. Can you imagine that if you know NSF and other people gave funding based on things that would contribute more citations, uh, now that you can actually do a halfway decent job of predicting? And what's even more shocking is that this works with law cases. So what, what judgments are going to be most influential and patents? which patents are going to be uh, cited too. And this is the paper that we're just completing uh, and is submitted for review. Um, here's another one. So, so RNA uh, is also a language, right? It's the language of, of biology. And when you sample uh, uh, microbiomes or you sample the seawater, you get this huge number of little fragments of RNA. But those fragments are, are like the words in natural language, and they co-occur a lot more than is would be uh, statistically random. I mean, hugely more. And they form a structure which you can analyze to find things that go together, just like those words that I showed you with, um, uh, with uh, natural language uh, LLMs. And when you find these sort of clumps of things that are working together, uh, then you can say, well, what is the effect of those? Well, here's one effect. So this is a result of looking at some 2,000 cows and their microbiome over a long period of time. It's a little spinoff that we have, and uh, it's reducing methane uh, emissions. And the uh, sort of state-of-the-art uh, uh, naive treatment is you give all the cows this different sort of feedstock, um, but by analyzing the microbiome, you can almost double the efficacy of that in reducing uh, uh, methane. So just to sort of point out what this means, this would mean if you did all the cows in the world this way, that would mean uh, one or two, maybe up to 3% of global emissions just by taking care of the microbiome in these cows. Pretty interesting. Um, so the take home messages here are, we can improve social exploration between communities using knowledge of social interaction patterns. And we can enhance those using AI uh, by sticking to this notion that uh, enhancement of context of social exploration 
may be a safe and effective way to address many serious problems. And then a little bit of advertising for my more recent books. Uh, and thanks. Great, thank you so much, Sandy. This is, I, I really enjoy this. Uh, the, the way you you frame AI as a, a tool to aid social exploration, right? I, I really like this, this angle. Maybe one question related to that is uh, uh, the many people ask the question about uh, will AI play a, a convergence role versus divergence role in terms of a different group of people, etc. So here you you made the comment that LM may help the median skill more than the the high skill there, right? So I want to Broaden it to say, what what's your thought about AI's general impact on society in terms of the convergence versus the divergence in that? Uh, then, then the second one related to that is uh, uh, the uh, the fact that LM helped median skill worker more than high skill worker. It seems uh, is is after the fact that we 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 empirically tested and that's the result. But is there a way we can engineer in a system like LM with that purpose in mind? Right, so we want to design some tools so that it convert it achieve a convergent role beforehand. Even is it is it possible, or just we just at the, the mercy of the, the 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 whatever we we come out of this? Right. Well, so what I see is is that there's an enormous race not to make bigger models. No one's really trying to do that, but to build specialized uh, uh, and actually quite smaller models. So in programming. And what is the data they're going to use to train on? Well, it's going to be experts. Mm -hmm. And so the things that come out of that model are not going to help experts all that much, but they are going to help. And this is the evidence. They help mid-skilled uh, uh, programmers. And I showed about, you know, sort of marketers, right? So this right. is out of uh, Wharton. Um, so if we try to, I mean, not people will use this technology in bad ways. Yep. Okay. People use all sorts of technology in bad ways. Uh, it's the people, not the technology. So what we want to do is try and figure out how we can use this technology to help people. And what I'm suggesting is given what we know about how people make decisions and how they learn, um, that helping them with presenting them with the common sense, what people normally do is a great strategy. It leaves the person in charge. So the ethical, a lot of the ethical uh, questions uh, are, are minimized. And it seems to be a major way where we can result in upskilling of people and perhaps transition them people from mid-skill to high-skill jobs, which is what we need as the AI deploys. We need people who are able to deal with this stuff. So I would suggest that what we have to do is focus there, is how do we build things that help mid-skill people to go to high-skill by telling them what, quote unquote, everybody knows. Uh, in companies, this is called the company culture. People know, like if you work for Ernst & Young, you know what are the way to approach things. But if you're a new guy in Ernst & Young, you don't know that. And this could be very useful for that. Mm, thank you, yeah. So that relates to another point you mentioned that uh, uh, continuing education, uh, we've been calling for this uh, for uh, multiple decades, right? Say we should have uh, this uh, lifelong learning, uh, the, the school is just the starting point, the learning, et cetera. But based on your empirical findings, we, we, we largely failed to, to achieve any result, right. right? Yeah. Right. So here, uh, do you see this, uh, this uh, LLM or AI can be an opportunity to really change that uh, failure here, right? Uh, that's actually related to part of the, the, the single project we've been collaborating on how AI can improve human capital on this, right? right. Give some thought on how this AI can play a, better role in this uh, continual education part of it. Well, so this is embedded continuing education. Mm. So, you know, if you're a new person in a business or a, a medium skilled person trying to become more skilled, this is something you can use to tell you what the common sense is and what other people do, which will you will learn as a human uh, and uh, uh, over time. And so you be, uh, you get the, the skills of how to do the job by looking at the things that are suggested that other people do and considering them for your uh, situation. And then, of course, you can reflect on these, too. You can say, well, I think this is the best choice. And you can ask the LLM what other people will say, and yeah. it'll give you a sort of uh, cultural average in terms of a response which you can choose to ignore, of course, right? But but it helps you uh, guide your thinking and your learning. And that idea of having embedded learning 
is uh, pretty clearly got some advantages over having to take time off work, take separate classes, blah, blah, blah. Hmm. Yeah. And then uh, the, the you, you mentioned at the, the first half of the presentation that uh, uh, your lab has done a lot of work in in terms of this uh, social interaction in the in the physical sense, right? People living yeah. in one place, traveling in another neighborhood, and maybe shopping in another neighborhood. Uh, so the fact that uh, COVID really hurt that quite a bit in this, right? So that's yeah. one way to uh, to boost the social interaction is try through this uh, uh, physical infrastructure or plantation, like the way we do. And then uh, the second half you presented like an AI or large language model as another alternative way to boost the social exploration here, right? So how do you see the two potentially uh, interact with each other or helping each other or substituting uh, each other between the physical way of versus the AI-based way of boosting social interactions? Well, I think the human interaction is the primary thing because there's all the stuff that isn't in language. There's body language, there's attitudes, there's emotions. And while some of those are a little, have echoes in language, they're not there completely. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, we need, we have a real need for human interaction. So uh, we, when we segregate our, our, our communities, you can see all the things that happen. One of the main things that happens is distrust. And distrust results in polarization. And we all can see a lot of that at the moment it's 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 probably one of the major problems that we face as a society is distrust between uh different strata different communities etc um so the physical is, is absolutely critical on the other hand you also have this more sort of cognitive skills and experience that you've had and if you can accelerate that um that strikes me as a good thing uh and uh so that you you know like if you go to the party, here's the things you ought to remember that they do at that sort of party, right? It's like, you know, don't wear that sort of dress, don't say these sorts of things, whatever it is, you, it's the social norms. And so if we can build things that do that, I think that that will help the situation. I see looking at the, uh, the comments here, yeah, you can do a lot of bad things too. Right? Let's not do that, okay? That's the correct answer to all of those comments. Don't do that. Uh, instead, let's focus on the good things, and then we'll figure out ways to uh, uh, discourage, prohibit, etc. the bad things. Uh, I do a lot on that. Uh, I was just at the UN uh, um, meet board meeting about how to do things like that. One of the primary things is you have to keep track of what this stuff is doing. We don't do that in our society. We, mm -hmm. you know, we, we don't know if the algorithms are plus or minus. We don't mm. know who they hurt and who they help because we don't keep track. We have to keep track and that has to be visible to other people so that we can find the bad things and we can figure out how to fix them. If you don't know what's going on, you're never going to fix it. Mm. Uh, and that's another sort of major source of uh, problem in our society. Yeah. So sort of lack Thank of transparency yeah. and accountability. Right. Thank you. So last set of question from me, uh, then we'll pass to, to Bua to curate the audience question. I encourage, again, people, please type your, your questions and comments to that. Right. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, Sandra, last night you recommended the paper, uh, the optimal human AI system for me to do as a, as a pre-read in that, in that paper. So in that paper, you, you mentioned about this exploration versus ex exploitation, right? Particularly uh, the, the difference between individual decision-making versus the group decision-making. Right. It seems that AI can help the individual in a very different way of how AI can help with the group. Right. For example, you mentioned that uh, as a group, instead of uh, choosing the maximum likelihood action, you could uh, distribute your action uh, into the frequency of action proportional to the likelihood so that you have uh, enough exploitation, but also you have enough uh, room for, for exploration. There, right. So, so this uh, angle uh, uh, maybe the first question is how do you see the difference between AI helping individual versus helping a group, right? That's one. The second one is uh, in the paper, you mentioned that uh, uh, this uh, optimality in terms of the human AI system design has a solid, uh, this uh, uh, optimality property in the domain that have explicit the learning outcome, right? Uh, for example, you mentioned finance, right? So what about the domains that uh, we do not have such explicit uh, learning outcome? Right. Then how do you think of about uh, this better design of this human AI system? 
So the fundamental thing here is, is that most of our culture uh, focuses on individuals making decisions essentially by themselves, rational individuals. But that rarely describes humans. Uh, you can go to school for 20 years and learn to do that. It's hard. That's why it takes 20 years. Um, in fact, most of our decision is culturally bound. And, uh, and that's a good thing because that means that we can learn from the experience of others. In terms of, say, sampling theory or optimal estimation or any of those sort of classic ways of looking at uh, determining best strategies, learning from others is, is a huge win. It multiplies your abilities by uh, you know, orders of magnitude. And that's the sort of social thing. In any particular community, the learnings of the community uh, we often give it names like culture. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the way we do things here. And it can be wrong, uh, but it, it is sort of the learned answers of this group of people. And, um, you know, approaching that is, uh, as opposed to changing the individual, is often something that's easier because you're adding other opportunities to the, to the community. And uh, people have that rationale element and they will tend to make those choices. In terms of objective outcomes where you can see things uh, quickly and, and in a very hard way, um, yes, learning stuff happens pretty well there because you can see the result. In other things, uh, and this is one of the major problems we have as a society, is we do things that look good in the short term, but in the long term, they're terrible. Um, so the short-term, long-term, climate change is a good example of this, right? The, the finance is another good example of this. There are many things like this. And um, typically the only way to, from a mathematical point of view, to do that is to aggregate over larger and larger numbers, more and more experience. This is a sort of a question of ergoticity. Um, so, you know, if it's just me making decisions, I might do stuff that looks really good, but then it kills me later. If I have samples from hundreds of thousands of people, I can say, hey, wait a second, for some of these people, it looks pretty bad and the trend is the wrong way. So um, that's like learning from a broader community, which we uh, tend not to do because we don't have transparency and uh, accountability. We don't know outcomes of actions uh, in some way that is reliable and, and, uh, and truthy to use that word. I like that word. Great. Uh, th thanks, uh, Vuang, for the audience questions. Yeah. Thank you, Sandy, for that uh, fascinating talk. The chat, as always, has exploded with comments and questions, and I'll be sure to send you a copy so that you can go through it before your talk uh, later on. Uh, so I'm going to combine two threads of questions into one. Uh, so you mentioned how most LLMs have been trained on Reddit, and that's probably not the best source. Yeah. Uh, so this introduces it's a joke also, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> true, but a joke. <laughs> so, uh, it, I mean, the, there is this whole idea of, you know, bias in AI and particularly with large language models, you know, on what data set have you trained? Uh, you also mentioned that, you know, uh, company cultures is one, you gave the example of how company cultures can be transferred, you know, in terms of knowledge transfer, workforce training and development. So company cultures have a legacy of racism, gender bias built into them. So will AI perpetuate these cultures? Is this really a social benefit? So I'm just trying to combine you know, two, these two questions into one to get Okay, to yeah, so let me do that, okay? So first of all, um, the current generation of LLMs are trained omnivorously on everything, including Reddit, and that's probably a major source. So we have a project called the Provenance Project, which you can Google, which is going through and surveying open uh, data sets about things that you care about. Like, is this truly used by third parties? Uh, you know, was this done under human subjects approval, blah, 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 blah. So that you can get much cleaner training than just having to like go over Reddit. Um, and I think that's the trend that will happen. Everybody's racing to uh, establish good training corpi that, um, that can be used in a legal way and can be used in a way that is authoritative. It won't cure all the problems, but it'll cure a fair amount. And then the the company culture and racism and so forth, um, that's auditing, transparency, and accountability. The real problem, I mean, look, um, 
The real problem is we don't know until somebody, you know, collects the evidence, which is very difficult, makes the argument, which is very difficult. There ought to be standard ways of monitoring these things. And computers can do that. It's not hard. Uh, it's not expensive. But then there would be a public repository where you could say, okay, so here's the company policies. Is it racist? Well, statistical test should take you a good solid, you know, 20 seconds to answer that action as opposed to five years of your life. I remember a talk I was at at Oxford where uh, a, a leading person in this field got up and talked about bias and everything. Uh, and the justice minister of Kenya said, what you say may be true, but have you seen our current system? You know, judges, et cetera, the humans in our system are incredibly biased and we don't hold them to account either. So I'm a big advocate of, we ought to have auditing of everything. We ought to be able to get feedback about actions versus sensitive categories and uh, about outcomes, both short and long. And then we'd have a hope of being able to find policies, actions that are good in both the short and the long term. Until we have that sort of uh, auditing, that sort of data, uh, I think it's, it's uh, all heuristic at best. I know that's not terribly popular, uh, but that's why the sustainable development goals at the UN have data metrics, is because unless you have data metrics that people agree on, it's all a bunch of hot air. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that makes sense. You know, auditing of an AI system through the through the data metrics that you proposed. Uh, so, you initially in your talk you mentioned that LLMs may be helpful to medium skill workers. Uh, so here there are two aspects. So one is helping them with discrete tasks versus insights. So how can AI enhance uh, the medium skill workers with insights, or can they not en enhance them with insights and just help them, uh, you know, with the, the way you mentioned it and, but not, you know, take out, take their jobs in the future. So what sort of is the balance over there, you know, enhancing their jobs now, but possibly take over their jobs in the future, or can AI actually give them the insight they require to move up from a medium to a high skill uh, job? So, so look, um, I don't have all the answers. Okay. <laughs> um, what I do know is, or what I believe is that um, we can design things that will help lower skilled workers to become higher skilled. And that's a major step towards solving the problems that you just did. Will it solve it all? Probably not. Um, but if we have better, uh, less segregation in our society, so there's better spread of opportunities and we have a continuous upskilling going on, it seems like we're likely to be better off than if we don't do those things. If we continue in uh, sort of a segregated siloed society. I see there's a lot of things about privacy. And yes, you can do stupid things. Uh, don't. Okay. So one of the major threads of what we do is around privacy uh, and how you do auditing, how you do other things like that, uh, where you don't give up personal data at all. Uh, you know, I was the one that led the discussion at Davos that turned into GDPR. Privacy is sort of at the core of what we do. Um, so, you know, uh, Take a look at it, right? Uh, take a look at the sort of things that are happening there. It's now possible to audit things uh, in ways that are um, were impossible only a few years ago in terms of privacy and in terms of security. Uh, there are some inevitable trade-offs. Uh, if you're going to hold people accountable, then you have to know who to be accountable. But one can make a judicial uh, uh, path for that. Uh, and then, of course, the judiciary has problems and so forth. But but without data, without knowing what's happening, uh, it's going to be very hard to do anything sensible. So it, it, it's great that you brought up the point of privacy as well. So there was one comment which mentioned that they'd be curious as to what percentage of conversations that happen across the globe on any given day are digital. And, uh, you, you know, there's this whole aspects of, you know, your car listening on to you all the time, Alexa and, you know, Google Home are listening to all these conversations yeah, yeah. and it being transferred. So just your thoughts on, you know, you, you mentioned privacy, the GDPR in, in, in EU. So are these really being used? What are the ways that one can, you know, have a like hard turn off button on these devices? 
Well, so currently they're not being used, right? First of all, it's, some of these things are relatively new from a technological point of view. So that's not too surprising. Some are. The economic incentives of the big companies are not aligned with our incentives. So one of the things that we uh, try to work on is distributed systems where you control your data. Absolutely. Right. And you can work with your community to get insights that you want and you can choose the community. So if you look at transformers.mit.edu, uh, you can see a lot of the sort of stuff that we're we're thinking about in that sort of area because, you know, people want to learn from their friends and so forth, but they don't want to like post it on Reddit. Right? It's like that's crazy. Um, there is this, uh, you know, this really sort of delicate dance you have to do with data and privacy and uh, accountability. And the good news is is that the the mathematical tools are being and have been. Uh, largely developed, I think, to do to do a lot of this. There's still work to do. Uh, the bad news is is that the current systems don't use these, um, and we have to cook up uh, ways to uh, encourage, quote unquote, those things, which is going to be a combination of law and economic incentives of some sort. And that's a whole nother. You could have a long conversation about how you change the economic incentives, but. People are, are thinking about it. They're doing it. We're involved in that conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not being ignored. It's just uh, a difficult conversation. Let me just actually put something out there just so people understand, okay? Um, uh, General, uh, Chief Secretary, General Secretary Xi of China, right? It was like the largest... Um, uh, representative Marxism, a lot of voice for Marxism, recently said data is a new primary means of, of production along with capital and labor. And if you think about that, what he's saying is, is that classic Marxism is done. It's now not a battle between capital and labor. It's a battle between data, capital, and labor. And that sort of gives you a sense of the magnitude of this problem. And if you look at what society did with capital and, and labor, it took a century or more, for instance, to form labor unions, to pressure companies, to uh, establish uh, principles, to get laws enacted. And uh, the same thing with capital, with agricultural banks and credit unions. And it's not a fixed thing. It's not like you can do it once and it's done. It evolves over time. So currently we're in uh, a, a new evolutionary phase of, of labor and a new evolutionary phase of capital. Mm. The problem with data is we don't have any institutions. We don't have any norms for it, basically. It's new. Uh, mm. And so we're back in the robber baron era of capital. We're back in the... Uh, uh, the early industrial age where kids were working 14 hours a day. That's where we are with data, okay? Just face it. Wow. <laughs> and, <laughs> and what we have to do is we have to like develop the right sort of institutions to be able to deal with this now uh, critical element of society. Something yeah. that is really, you take seriously. It's not right. just an extra thing or an irritant. It's a major part of society. Yeah. Re yeah. Sandy, related, related to that is uh, just yesterday, uh, the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is trying to organize a group of uh, tech uh, companies say, let's let's think about something on AI regulation and what the role federal government should play, et cetera, right? Uh, uh, first of all, what, what's your view on, on what federal government's role, you know, what, what's the general area they should intervene? But more specifically, uh, relate to the fact that AI can be used as a tool to boost the social exploration on that aspect, right? Is there anything that's necessary from the policy perspective to boost that or any concerns that we need to address? Well, we work with the EU on their AI regulation and I work with Brookings, uh, which is sort of helped shape the Biden uh, administration and I work with other countries too. Um, and there are lots of details in there. Um, the primary thing that I come away with is we don't really understand all the risks and dangers. We don't really understand what are the good things. Uh, it needs some more exploration, but that has to be safe exploration. And that's why I'm such a big fan of auditing. So that, you know, perhaps the audits are not public. 
But it ought to be the case that if you worry about something, that you can get a, a court order and an examination of what it's doing against any sort of particular problem. And that should be a matter of minutes, not years, of a dollar or two, not millions of dollars. In our legal system, a lot of the big problems are identifying, noticing that there's something wrong, and then doing discovery, which is a legal term, which is hugely expensive and slow, and then litigation. We could take that and turn that into something that you know your average person could do for a dollar ninety-five uh, in you know half an hour. That would be progress, <laughs> okay? And fortunately, that's part of the vision that people have. Uh, they don't do quite as far as I do, um, but I'll notice that the first actually operational AI regulation out of Singapore, where what they're doing is auditing the AI. If you want to release a product and you claim it does X, you have to prove it before you get licensed to do it. Sounds like not a bad idea. And the only thing that's wrong with their regulation is I want them to audit it every month. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> you know, world changes uh, and uh, things go off the rails. Right. That, that's that's wonderful. Uh, we, we, we'll get to the end of the hour now. Uh, this is such a brilliant discussion. Thank you so much, Sandy. Everybody, please join me. Thank Professor Fenton for the presentation and the conversation. It's really, really wonderful. That's great. Pleasure. Hope, hope, hope it yeah. helps this conversation broadly. <laughs> indeed. Indeed, yeah.